That's why I hate masks. They always get up in my glasses and everything. Praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> Certainly, we thank God for being here tonight with you to minister the word of the Lord. I want to say to Pastor Simpson and to his wife, God bless both of you. <clears throat> My uh, my daughter and I were driving back from Dover, Delaware, Sunday. We were ministering, and uh, we were cruising down the road and uh, had a flat, broke down right on 301, and uh, Kyra had the pastor on, and you were preaching about Jacob. Uh, and I was thinking about Jacob. Uh, his leg was uh, out of joint, and here we are with this tire. My, my car was like Jacob. We couldn't go nowhere. We was halted. <laughs> and uh, but God blessed us. We got that car straightened out and came home. And I heard some of the word pastor while we were traveling back, and uh, very encouraging. Uh, tonight, I want to, I am not preaching or teaching tonight. I want to minister to you if I can, and uh, I want to try to answer some questions that I believe that many of you may have in your heart about things that are going on in your life, and I'm not going to be long either. So having said that, I, wanna, I would like to direct your attention to the book of Luke, the sixth chapter, and the twelfth verse. I want to also say that I want, I want to give a shout out to my wife who's watching. <laughs> Amen. Thank and praise God for her and uh, her, her, uh, her love for this church, her love for God, her love for me, which can be difficult at times because of, of all that makes me what I am. But we thank God. And I want to also give a shout out to the Escobars, my Bible study students. They're watching as well. We thank God for them. Amen. Luke, the sixth chapter and the 12th verse, the Bible says, And it came to pass in those days that when he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when, and when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. Simon, whom he also called Peter, and Andrew, his brother James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. And I want to minister to you tonight on this simple subject, the ministry of the cupbearer. The ministry of the cupbearer. Father, bless the ministry of the word. I pray that you would touch your people tonight, encourage their hearts, minister to every need that's in this place in Jesus' name. Let your anointing come upon us and give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. <clears throat> now, I, I read these verses of scripture, and my mind began to immediately start asking questions about the Lord and what he was doing in selecting these individuals to be not just disciples, but to be apostles. The Bible says that God knows everything. How many of y'all believe that? He knows every single thing there is to know. 1 John 3 and 20 says, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. God knows all things. John 21, 17. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. 
Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. John 16, 29 through 30, his disciples said unto him, lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb. Now we are sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee. But by this we believe that thou camest forth from God. So these are just a few scriptures. I could go to many others, but for the sake of time, these are scriptures that point to the fact that Jesus knows everything. And so the selection of the apostles from the multitude of disciples was not something that he had taken lightly. Because if you notice in Luke chapter 6, the Bible says that he was praying all night long, praying, trying to make sure that whoever was going to be these men that he was going to pour into was the will of God. And so he's praying. He's seeking God. He wants to know exactly what it is to know that he needs to do with these men out of this multitude. And so... Some of these men, as I begin to look at this list of people that he was going to elect, became very powerful men of God. We live by their teaching still to this day. One of them, Brother um, Bond just talked about, Paul was not on this list, but he also was one of the Lord's apostles, and we live by his teachings as well. But when I look at the latter part of that list, with knowing that Jesus knows all things, I had to ask myself, why would you pick Judas? Because Judas is going to betray you. As a matter of fact, in John 6 and verse 70, Jesus answered them, have not I chosen 12 of you, but one of you is a devil. The word devil here means to be a slanderer, a false accuser, to unjustly criticize or to hurt, to be endeavored to sever a relationship. So here, out of all these men, he had the great preaching Peter. He had the sons of Zebedee. He had the tax collector. The list goes on of men that we, we read their writings, but here he decided to pick a devil and make him an apostle. Now, let me clarify a few things for you, because I know that we all like to jump on Judas Iscariot and get on his case, but I want to give you some history about Judas just for a moment here, because I'm sure that question has run through your mind if you've been in the church at any length of time. Lord, out of all the people that, it, that could be one of the 12, you would pick Judas. I would, now, if it was me... I would have went to where John the Baptist was. I would have took him out of prison. I would have, I would have said, John, come on, and you, you're going to be now. You were the forerunner. Now you can be one of my apostles. He could have did that. Or he could have just went to the apostle Paul. While, while Paul was very skilled in the law, he knew the Bible, so why not make him one? He could be that 12th. Or just go find Matthias, who eventually would be one of the 12, and let Matthias just... We're just going to bypass Judas altogether and let Matthias be the 12th. But there is a specific reason, and I want to share that with you tonight, and I hope that it will bless you and help you in your current situation as to why Judas. Why Judas? Well, I want you to consider a few things. First of all, you have to look at the time in, in which Judas Iscariot lived in. Um. And, and I, I was just doing some research, search, and this is some of the things I came up with. During the first century, Rome had dominion over Israel. In 63 B.C., after much turmoil and civil war within Israel, the Romans invaded and conquered Jerusalem. And in order to keep control over the Galilean and Judean peoples, Julius Caesar installed Herod to be a king. Not only did Herod expand the temple in Jerusalem to be more grandiose and Hellenistic in its Roman appearance, 
but he also imposed a sacrifice that the priests would give on behalf of Rome and the emperor. Additionally, Herod had whole cities named to give reverence to Caesar as well as imperial temples and fortresses to reinforce Roman control. The great building campaigns were not possible without great taxation of the peoples of Galilee, Samaria, and Judea, leaving these cities in great poverty. So Judas is living in a, in a, in a, uh, a state where Rome is collapsing Jerusalem. The taxing to establish the appearance of Rome in Jerusalem was, was very heavy and very taxing on the people. And not only that, but they were required to pay taxes to the Roman Empire. But not only that, but they also continued to function as a temple state and were also required to pay tithes and sacrifices of the Jewish religion to Rome. So that could be seen as a form of idolatry. They, they, it was just, they were going crazy with this taxation and tithes and offerings. And so after decades of multiple demands from multiple layers of rulers, many village families fell increasingly into debt and were faced with loss of their family's inheritance of land. The impoverishment of families led to the disintegration of village community. So again, because of Ro Rome's uh, handprint being pressed down heavily upon Israel and Jerusalem, it left the country in poverty. And so I can imagine Judas seeing this and he was disturbed by it in so much that history says that Judas became a part of a group of men called the Sakari. I don't know if you ever heard of that. But the Sakari were basically gangsters. These were people that hated Rome and they hated the Roman um, oppression. And so what they would do is when they would find somebody in Jerusalem that was from Rome, and if it was a crowd of people around, they carried knives on themselves. And what they would do is they would walk up to this person that was a, of Rome or if they were a Roman sympathizer and they would stab them real quick and then blend back, back into the crowd. Judas was a very vicious man. You notice when you read the scripture, nobody's giving any beef to Judas. Nobody's causing him any trouble because they know that Judas is, uh, he has the tendency to commit violent acts. Because he hates Rome and he hates the oppression that Rome brings. And it wasn't, that wasn't a, 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 a belief that was exclusive to Judas. All the disciples had this in their hearts. Because in Acts chapter 1, if you read the scripture, the Bible says that the disciples said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So all of them had this desire to see this Roman oppression broken. And that wasn't Jesus' focus at all. And that's what I believe eventually caused Judas to change from just being a casual follower of Jesus to now being an individual that would look for occasion to betray Jesus. And so my initial question that I asked you was, why would the Lord pick him to be his apostle? Well, first of all, number one, Judas was a person of suffering. Judas lived in pain that was caused by the, the uh, resulting conditions of the Roman occupancy of Israel. Secondly, and here's where I'm getting ready to start talking to you right here. Jesus is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And if you look at history or even scripture, you will find that every king had a cupbearer. And a cupbearer was very significant because a cupbearer possessed information that the king perhaps did not know or needed at certain times to accomplish certain things. The third reason, on the other side, or, or should, let me just go back to that second point for just for a second. When, when Judas, when Jesus was in Gethsemane, 
you'll notice that he starts talking about a cup passing from him. Because Judas, this traitor, is bringing a whole bunch of people to introduce Jesus Christ to a level of suffering that he would never even, that he had never experienced. So Judas, brothers and sisters, is a cupbearer. And he's going to bring this cup of suffering to Jesus Christ, and Jesus is going to drink it. And I got to thinking about that. If Jesus could spend all night praying about a devil being a part of his group of disciples, being a part of the 12, why do we get upset when God puts devils in our lives for the purpose of introducing suffering to our lives? Out of all the doctrines in the Bible, brothers and sisters, the one doctrine that we don't like, it's in there, but we don't like to talk about it, is the doctrine of suffering. We love to talk about joy. We love to talk about dancing and praising God and, and celebrating and all these different things. But do you know that suffering is just as much a part of the Bible as the oneness of God is? It's a theme that's woven throughout the scriptures. And I, I, I ask God, God, why do you pick suffering? Because before there can be glory, there has to be suffering. Paul said, for I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul told Timothy, he said, if we suffer, we will reign with him. So suffering is a part of the equation. And, and, and God knows that none of us are going to go and, and personally inflict ourselves and make ourselves suffer. Doesn't the scripture says that no man yet hated his own flesh, but he nourished it, he cherished it. So we love ourselves. I'm not going to go and stick my hand in some fire and say, hey, Lord, look, I'm suffering for you. <laughs> That's kind of retarded, isn't it? So God knows that you won't in induce suffering on yourself because it doesn't make sense. So that's why he will bring somebody to you. That will present a cup for you. And God wants to know, will you drink from that cup of suffering or will you try to get out of it? And many of us try to get out of it and that's why we never see the glory and we never see the next dimension and we never see what else God has in store for us because we refuse to go through the avenue of suffering, which is the avenue to attain that next level in God. Praise the Lord, somebody. The Bible says in the book of Luke, the 22nd chapter in verse 39, and he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that you enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and he kneeled down and he prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And so Judas comes, and Jesus starts drinking from this cup. And the disciples are looking at what's going on, and there's chaos breaking loose right in Gethsemane. And Peter, he pulls out a sword. He's about to start cutting people's heads off, stabbing people. I, don't, I, I believe that when he was swung for Malchus's head, he wasn't trying to cut his ear off. I think he was trying to behead Malchus. He was trying to split his head open. He was trying to kill him right on the spot to make a statement. Everybody get back. You can touch anybody else in this garden, but you're not going to touch Jesus. And so the Bible says in John 18 and 11, Then Jesus said unto Peter, Put up thy sword into thy sheath, the cup which my father hath given me. Shall I not drink it? The cupbearer is the one that will ultimately set the will of God in motion for your life's intended purpose. And that's why everybody in this place, if you say you are a part of God's church, then you are a royal priesthood. 
You are a king. God made us kings and priests, the book of Revelation says. So if you are a king, if you are a part of a royal priesthood, then God has assigned for you to have a cupbearer. And you can refuse the cup and you can deny the cup and try to get out of the cup and won't drink of the cup all you want to and all you're doing is prolonging the process because God's going to find a way to get you to drink of that cup of suffering because he intends for you to get to that place in him that he wants you to be. I was thinking about Pharaoh. He had, you know, there's cup bearers in the Old Testament too. (laughs) Pharaoh had a cup bearer. I think this guy gave the Pharaoh something to drink. The Pharaoh was made him sick or something. So he threw him in prison. The cupbearer was doing his job, giving the Pharaoh something to drink. He couldn't help that it made him sick. He threw him in prison. But you know what he had to do? Eventually he had to get that cupbearer out of prison and restore him back. See, God's not going let to the, let the cupbearer depart from your life. You can try to get rid of him all you want, but he's going to reestablish him. It may be a different person. It may be a different place. It may be a different situation, but God is not going to let that cup pass from you because it's his will for you to drink it. And if Jesus Christ had to drink from his cup of suffering, why should we try to deny ourselves the same thing that God has appointed for us to do? We complain about suffering. We hate suffering. We detest suffering. We bypass people that suffer. We don't want to look at things that that contain suffering. We hate the sound of suffering. We don't want to see anything that talks about suffering. We despise suffering. I know when my dad was in the hospital and I would go to see him, I'd walk down the, ho- the hallways of Northwest Hospital, and I'd hear people hollering and screaming. And, and sometimes even when I go see Sister Fox, I can hear some of these old people saying, help me, help me. I'm in the floor, help me. Somebody help me. And, and I, I, I want to go, but I can't go because I'm not qualified to go. So I just keep going, and I mind my business, and I... And I, I'll try to get to my wife's room in peace. But you just see suffering and you can smell suffering. And it's all over the place. We despise suffering. But don't you know God is pleased with suffering? Because when Jesus was being bruised, don't you know the Bible says it, it, it pleased God to bruise him? There's just something about this thing where God really gets to see who you are and you get to really see who you are, not in the good times, not in the victorious times, not in the times of sensational or or pleasure, but in the times of brokenness, in the times of despair, in the times when you don't know what to do. And when you've done all to stand, you don't know if you want to stand or break down and give up and collapse. That's when God's evaluating and looking at the equation and seeing if you are intent on drinking every bit of the poison that's in that cup, that suffering, cup of suffering. I used to make Kool-Aid when I was little. <laughs> I, I got to loosen this up a little bit here. Y'all, y'all throwing me off here. Brother Bond, I was your son's age. I was making Kool-Aid. Now, back at that, they had two, two ways to make Kool-Aid. They had Kool-Aid in the packs. And you had to add the sugar. And then they had the can where it had the sugar already in there. All you had to do was just scoop it out. Yeah, I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so I scoop it out, put it in a, and, and some, I was selfish. I, instead of making a picture for everybody, I just make me a glass for myself. I just make me a cup for Cause this is my cup. This is my cup. I can't make a cup for everybody else because I don't know how they like their Kool-Aid. I'm just this is mine. I like mine sweet. And I'd put them scoops in there and I'd pour the water on top and I'd stir it a little bit. And sometimes you you know you ain't did it right because when you drink it, it still tastes like water. It it changed color, but it still tastes like water. 
and you keep drinking it, and then it starts getting sweet, and it gets sweeter. Then it gets to the point it's unbearable. You got to add more water because it's, it's too sweet. It's like syrup. It's messed up. And I'm using that light illustration to make a very serious point. That sometimes you can tell when suffering is making its way to you. And it starts off real subtle. And then it, the pain just gradually increases. I, I remember Sister Fox and I was in Virginia Beach. We were uh, we had just finished parasailing, having a great time. And we had uh, got back onto the beach and this is the first time I've ever seen an MS flare up in my wife. We were walking up on the beach there, and she was holding, holding her skirt because she didn't want to get a whole bunch of sand in there. And we were walking back to the hotel, and she just started just walking in a circle just like this. And I'm like, Donnie, what are you doing? She's like, I don't know. My legs are just going. I'm just, and, and, and I watched, and then she had a, a few more episodes of that, then that subsided. And then it got to the point, then the walker came. Then the wheelchair came. And now we're at where we are now, just not walking at all. And I just, and this is a couple of years, just watching this disease, watching her health betray her. And God is bringing this cup of suffering to us in a very unique way, and we're both drinking out of it. And I said to her, I said, honey, I'm praying for you. I want you to make it. I, I, I feel so sorry for you. And she looked at me. And she said something to me that that is just amazing. She said, she said, no, Kevin. She said, I'm praying for you. She said, because it's, it's just you. It's, I'm praying for you. And have I ever lived those words to just see her prophecy come true, how life has just taken on such a different shape because we're both suffering in a different way, but we're drinking from the same cup. But I want to tell you, one, one, some, one songwriter said, there will be glory after this. That's, that's what's going to happen. There's some kind of way. I don't know. I can't see it. I see disaster. I see suffering. I see darkness. I see gloom. I see loneliness. But somewhere God says there's something you don't see. And eventually, if you just keep drinking this cup, there's something you're going to see. If you just keep drinking, if you keep drinking, I don't like drinking this cup. How many of you ever drank something that was disgusting? I got, I go to the herb store. They got these bitters. You, my Jamaican folks, respect. <laughs> y'all know about bitters, don't y'all? Y'all, yeah, bitters, yeah. I, I, Brother Valley, I know you know about bitters, don't you? Okay. Well, bitters is something that is it's good for you, but it's very disgusting. It's very nasty. And all of oregano is very disgusting. I, 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 put thing, I, I put things in my mouth that's very nasty like this, but they're good for you. The taste is bad, but the overall benefit is worth the bad taste. Are you listening? So it might be hard to lift that cup to your mouth. But I want to challenge you, brothers and sisters, to drink it. Now, Judas comes from the Hebrew word or, or the Greek word Judah. Judas is actually Judah. Judas is Greek for the Hebrew word Judah. <laughs> y'all know y'all know what Judah means, right? Y'all sure y'all know what Judah means? Judah means praise or to be celebrated. So even though it doesn't feel or seem good, with all the negativity that Judas brings with him, there's something else that Judas brings with him too. And if you're drinking the suffering, there's also some praise in that cup too. 
and if you'll take the suffering, you can also lift your hands. And you can say like Job said, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You can say like Jesus said on the, on the cross, Father, unto thee I commend my spirit. You can worship, you can give God praise right in the midst of all the calamity and the suffering that you're ingesting in your life. I know sometimes it's hard. I know sometimes it's difficult. I know sometimes you don't even feel like saying anything. There have been times I didn't feel like talking to nobody, including God. Because the suffering was so intense. One night I went to work. And it was just got, we joke around, we go to work a lot of times, because we get ready to deal with some very serious stuff, working with inmates and so forth. So we keep each other loose, we crack jokes on each other, we, we, we punch on each other, bump in it. We just, you know, guys being guys. But this one night, I was going through it, Brother Terry, and I just sat in a chair. Everybody was coming in, and this one guy, he started cracking jokes on me, and so I said, man, I don't feel like it tonight. Not tonight. No, I just, I, I, my mind is not even there. See, suffering will make you focus. You know, when, 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 when you're going through, you are just looking and you are focused on the object of that suffering. And you are just, you, because God is trying to teach something. He's trying to say something. The scripture says that Jesus learned obedience through the things that he Jesus learned obedience through the things that he Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Not the mountaintop, not the miracles, not the preaching, not the casting out of devils. It was those times of suffering. So now when I look at his list of disciples or apostles that he spent all night picking, it makes perfect sense why Judas is there. Because Judas is the cupbearer that's going to bring the suffering that's necessary to Christ's life. And the same is true in your life. Because you are his child, because his hand is upon you, because he loves you, because he has ordained you and called you and anointed you. He has therefore designated you as a king to have a cupbearer. to drink from that cup. You know, when you're suffering, everybody's got advice for you. Yeah. I don't know who it was. Somebody was preaching up here. I don't know if it was the pastor or Elder Brown. Somebody said, you know, you got people that have never been married giving married advice. <laughs> the married couples. <laughs> Brother Mike, Sister Destiny, don't y'all let nobody get in y'all's business. People ask you how y'all doing. We're doing great. Hell's breaking loose. We're doing great. Doing great. We're together. We're great. As long as you together, you're great. My mother-in-law has never got in my business in 23 years. Never. Anytime, if, if she hears my voice in the room, is that your husband? Oh, you need to go. Go ahead, I'll talk with you later. She hang the phone up. <laughs> she doesn't get in. My, my father-in-law, he could care less. He, he just, he, son, how you doing? Oh, doing great. He's old man, just chill. I'm doing great, Dad, hanging out. How you doing? doing how about the Orioles? Oh, they stink. How about them ravens? They doing great. You know, he, he's laid back. But my point is, you got to watch who you take advice from. Especially when you're suffering. Mark 15, 32. Let the king, let Christ the king of Israel descend now from the cross. Jesus hears this. That we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. Luke 23, 35. 
And the people stood beholding. And the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. Matthew 27, 42. He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He's hearing all these conversations hanging on a cross. They're giving him advice. You're, you're the king of Israel. You, we, we've seen you save other people. Save yourself. You can't take advice from everybody when you are on a cross suffering. Especially when it's part of the cup that you're drinking out of. God has ordained suffering as part of the equation for the people of God. Hebrews 12 and 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. Everybody say endured. That Greek word endured is the same as suffer. He suffered the cross, despising the shame. And now, because like I told you, first there's suffering and then there's glory. Look where he's sitting at now. Suffering. It co suffering comes in different packages. Different, it manifests itself different ways. It can manifest itself through your finances. It can come through your health. It can come through your employment. It can come through your spouse. It can come through people in the church. It can come from anywhere. And instead of running from it, I think we as people of God need to understand, I'm going to embrace this. You know what Paul said when he was suffering? He said, this is my time to glory. I'm going to glory in my infirmities when I'm weak, when I have no strength, when I don't know what to do. This is my time to glory. He said, because when I'm weak, that's when I'm really strong. Drinking from this cup. I've got just one more scripture here. But I want to read it to you, not in the King James. I want to read it to you in the Berean literal Bible. Luke 9, 23 says, and he was saying to all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and let him take up his cross every day and let him follow me. So the worst thing that I could ever do when I'm carrying my cross is, is, is listen to the advice of others and get off the cross, forfeit the cross, and try to control the amount of suffering that is happening in my life. I'm going to tell you right now, if I knew where the exit was for my wife and I, we would walk through that exit right now. If I knew the interstate, the highway, the airplane, the airport, whatever, if I knew a way for us to both get out of this, this, uh, this season of suffering that even is affecting my daughters, they're not saying nothing, but I know that they're going through it too. And, and it is, it's affected even some of you in this church, and that's why you go see her and you call her, and, and I appreciate that. It, 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 has, it just has this ripple effect. But I know that on the other side of this, whenever that is, there's going to be some glory. There's going to be some glory. Jesus said this one thing. He looked at the sons of Zebedee and he said, can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? Do you know what he was talking about when he said that? He's talking about suffering. Now, if we've been baptized in Jesus' name in water, if we've been baptized with the Holy Ghost, 
why would we despise this unspoken of baptism that's very much in the Bible spoken of by the Lord Jesus Christ? It's there. It's a part of the apostolic faith. You show me a person that has never suffered, I show you a person that doesn't know a thing about God. Because God reveals himself in seasons of suffering. God speaks real loud and clear when no other person has your attention except that suffering. That's why God lets it happen, because that way you'll turn off the TV, you'll get off the cell phone, you'll get off the computer, you, you'll, you'll stop all your nonsense conversations, and you'll meet him in prayer. And when you meet him in prayer, that's when he'll begin to start talking to you and give you some answers and give you some direction and give you some strength that you're going to need to continue to drink from that cup. And when it's over, that's when it's over. It's not over until he says it is finished. That's what Jesus said when he was on the cross. It's finished. I drank the whole thing. It's all gone. And then he ascended into heaven afterwards, shortly thereafter. So, my brothers and sisters, tonight, I, I have a question. Y'all going y'all don't laugh at this, but I brought some cups here tonight. And I want to know if you're going to do like Jesus. Are you going to refuse a cup or are you going to take a cup? If you're in a season of suffering, I'm asking you to embrace your suffering. And I'm going to ask you to take a cup. And you can tell God, Lord, I want, that, I want this cup to pass, but if you're telling me I have to drink from this cup, then I'm going to drink it. Let's stand together. You're wondering why that coworker's on your job constantly causing you problems, why you have marital problems, why you have this, that, why, why the suffering, why God, why so much pain, why so much difficulty, because there's a place he's trying to take you. And I'm just going to open this altar up tonight. If you want to bring your situation, that this cup, you can take it with you, you can whatever you want to do, but I, I, I want to invite you to take a cup and say, Lord, nevertheless, not my will, not my will. Just take one cup, and then we're going to pray. Once you get a cup, we're going to pray. Praise God. Once you get a cup, just stand by. We're going, we're going to pray. Praise the Lord. I know this is a little unusual tonight, but it's okay. So all the cups are gone? Okay. Praise God. Yeah, my wife and I are sharing a cup. Y'all can share a cup, too. All right. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Only you know what's in this cup. Only you know what's in that cup. 
I want you to begin to ask God right now, Lord, everything that's in me that's resisting this cup, take it away. And give me the faith and the boldness that you had in Gethsemane so that your will is done in my life. Let me drink this cup, Father. This, this, this suffering, this dimension that you're wanting me to go into that I've been resisting. You know, the pastor talked tonight about pruning. Pruning is painful. Pruning involves separation. Pruning has an element of suffering in it. So I want you just to pray right now. Father, you see and you know what you've ordained my life to, to be. And everything that you put inside this cup, Father, I, I, I know I'm not going to like it, but Lord, I, I'm going to drink it because I know that it's your will. Why don't you tell the Lord that right now? Everything, God, that's in this cup, I'm going to drink it. I'm going to drink it, Father. It's difficult. It tastes bad. There's pain in this offering. There's pain in this cup. There, there, there's suffering in this cup. And Lord, help me to deal with the person or the place or the situation with the right spirit that brought this cup to my life. That I don't hate them and then bring even more trauma to myself. Help me to have a forgiving spirit toward the one that brought this cup to me. The Judas that came to my life and brought this cup to me. Help me to forgive right now, God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm going to tell you right now, this doesn't feel good. This, this, is, this, is, this is a hard thing. This is the hardest thing in my life that I've ever had to go through. But I'm drinking this. You've appointed it for me to drink it. You've designated for me to drink it, so I'm drinking it, Father. Hallelujah. Why don't you renew a covenant with the Lord right now? I'm not running from this cup. I'm not going to deny this cup anymore, Father. In the name of Jesus. Praise God. Can we all lift our hands? Let's lift our hands. Lord, I present my body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you, O oh God. I belong only to you. I'm exclusively yours. And everything about me belongs to you. You have the right to make decisions in my life. You have the right to plant tares in my life, even though I may not agree with it and understand it, but... And I know these things might grow in my life and cause me pain. But Lord, you're God. And you know all things. Hallelujah. And if you would spend all night picking your apostles out of a group of disciples, I know you've spent time looking at my life and you've spent time planning events, circumstances, and placing people in my life, some for my good, some for my promotion, some for my development, and even though there may and there may be some that you have sent to bring a cup of suffering my way. Oh God, help me to have your spirit. Give me the spirit of Gethsemane. Oh God, if it's possible, let this cup pass, but nevertheless, not my will, not my will. Not my will, but your will, Father. Your will. That your will be perfected. In Jesus' name. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, they're not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed. In Jesus' name. I want to read one more scripture from you just before we close here tonight. 
praise God. The Bible says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered in the, for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Verse 12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice in so much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Rejoice. The scripture said rejoice. Rejoice that you get to drink from a cup. Rejoice in as much as you are partaker of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Verse 15 says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the sinner and the ungodly and the where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well doing as unto a faithful creator praise the Lord God bless you Take your cup home with you. Uh, I think we heard from the Lord tonight. I think, I think we all can benefit by this. Uh, God bless you. You dismiss in Jesus' name. Don't forget about tomorrow's event. We'll see you there if you can make it.